I'd like to welcome our next speaker, Paul Ashbin, um, a friend and colleague of mine for some time. Um, and I think it would be fair to say that his interest in um, uh, the notion of, of, of knowledge and recasting the positioning of knowledge in, uh, in, within higher education practices is a, a very interesting uh, and novel area of, of, uh, of research. And I'd also like to mention his uh, uh, recent uh, success at being, uh, participating in the development of the Centre for Engaged Global Higher Education. You can see it's a very understated sort of centre. <laughs> Um, but uh, now that they've dropped the engage now, oh, yeah, right, just okay. Centre for Global Higher Education, even oh, more well, modest, much more, much more limited, <laughs> much more limited. Anyway, Paul, uh, well done Sorry, on that, and, uh, and uh, I'll hand over you to uh, to you to uh, uh, to continue your talk. Thanks very much. Okay, so so I guess the question that um, underpins this talk is why would going to university change anyone? Which, in a way, Jen has already provided an answer to. I think. Um, in her very thoughtful presentation. This question for me is really informed by the late lamented David Watson's later work um, in the question of conscience, where he says, if people are gonna make these bland statements about higher education being transformative, then we need to know what that means. Is higher education a necessary condition for this transformation? Or can other things do it? Is it a sufficient condition for transformation? Is everyone transformed? You know, and, 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 and how does this, and what is it about higher education that leads to the transformation? And I found that, that book and those arguments, and when he presented them over a series of presidential addresses at the SRHE, really powerful way of trying to not take our own side too seriously. And I think part of what I'm trying to do um, with the arguments here is to not let us off the hook as higher education researchers. Too often, it's too easy to say, well, it is about transformation, and these policymakers just need to realize that higher education is really transformative. You can't compare in any meaningful way and just let us get on with that. And actually, we've got to accept the legitimate concerns that inform their pressure in order to make comparisons. And so what I'm going to try and do through this talk is to set up a tension between the need to think about higher education as transformative and the need to make comparisons between higher education and try and think about what that tension might tell us. Um, so in this talk, I'm going to draw on a number of pieces of work that I've done with other people. And all of these ideas are sort of collectively formed but I guess with Ash Ashwin's dodgy accent added on to them. Um, but I'll draw heavily on the work with Monica McLean and Andrew Abbas um, in the Pedagogic Quality and Inequality Project, where we um, tracked sociology students in four institutions in England through the three years of their degree and looked at the ways their experiences of sociology changed. Um, I'll also draw on work that um, I did recently with Devin McVitie, who works at the National Union of Students, where we tried to think about the different meanings of student engagement and the way of trying to bring together those meanings um, in, you know, there's this contrast between student engagement as engagement in courses and student engagement as student representation in students' unions. And what we were trying to do was to think about, is there a way of actually bringing these things together to talk about a single object or are they completely different objects? And then also recently with Manja Klementic, who's at University of Harvard at the moment, um, we've been doing some work um, looking at Bologna, and we were a part of a Bologna's researchers conference that did some work that we would hope informed the recent higher education ministers conference in Yerevan in Armenia, where they came out with a new statement about where the Bologna's process is going between now and 2020. So all of that work informs what I'm going to talk about now. And these ideas are sort of messy, they're unfinished, I'm not sure they quite connect together. So, you know, it's an invitation for you to think and interrogate rather than something that's polished and finished. Um, so on to the Yerevan communique. So as I said, this came from um, a recent meeting of higher education ministers um, looking at the European higher education area. And at the end of this um, meeting, the middle of May, they came out with a statement where they, by 2020, we are determined to achieve 
the European higher education area where our common goals are implemented in all member countries to ensure trust in each other's higher education systems, where automatic recognition of qualifications becomes a reality so that students and graduates can move easily throughout it, where higher education is contributing effectively to build inclusive societies founded on democratic values and human rights, and where our educational opportunities to provide the competences and skills required for European citizenship, innovation and employment. Enhancing the quality and relevance of teaching and learning is the main mission of the European higher education area. Now this, teaching and learning was never part of Bologna at the beginning. So this is an amazing statement in terms of teaching and learning. Um, and in some ways, it's a very inspiring statement about higher education. It's about building inclusive communities. It's founded on human rights. You know, so in some ways, it's a powerful text. And just a note on it being a text, you know, Murray and Bob talked about policy texts and um, Bob drew on Stephen Ball's argument saying, well, most policy analysis at the level of text, not at the level of discourse. A recent paper um, that I wrote with Karen Smith from the University of Greenwich we tracked through um, higher education policy texts in a series of journal articles in a particular year to look at the way policy texts are positioned. And whilst I would agree that in some way they focus on the textual, if you actually look about how much they actually engage with texts, they hardly do at all. If you actually look at how careful we are as higher education researchers to ensure that our analysis of policy is actually founded on what was written rather than our common sense understanding of what the policy was, actually it's very rare, it's very rare to have that sense of an incisive look at the text. Now, what I'm not saying is that that means it doesn't happen. What I'm saying is it means it's not written into journal articles. You know, and given that's where things are peer reviewed and where public debates take place, the fact that we can't show how our analysis of policy texts has lead us, led us to research policies in a particular way, to me helps to understand some of the frustration that policymakers have with educational research, that they're researching the policy they think existed rather than the policy as a text. And as Murray and Bob both indicated it's changed as it moves from text to practices, but at least go back to where it started from rather than assuming we all know what the policy is to begin with. So I talked about this tension, some exciting animation here, oh. um, and, and, and I've realized if it's a tension, actually those arrows should be the other side from each other, but you know, hey-ho, um, I've never been a terribly visual person, as you will see throughout this presentation. Um, but what I'm interested in is this sense of how does the, how does the transformational potential of undergraduate's degree knock against this need for comparability? And so, if we start with the transformational potential of degrees, this draws heavily on the work that I did with Monica and Andrew Abbas, um, where we looked at sociology across, the, followed sociology students through the three years of their degrees. That project was very much focused, the reason for its title, it was very much focused on the fact that these four institutions were differently positioned in higher education league tables for sociology. For sociology, it's really important to say that because you can always have a high performing course in an institution that's lowly ranked. But these were ranked for these courses. Two always at the top, top third of league tables for sociology, two in the bottom third. And we spent three years intensively looking at the quality of students' experiences. And it's not really what I'm talking about now, but just to finish that story, surprise, surprise, we found that league table position didn't match on to the quality of students' experiences. Well, who would have thunk it? Um, but the thing for me that was really interesting about, about the work, you know, the very productive work we did together, was, you know, relating it to David Watson's ideas as we developed our writing, is this sense of trying to develop an answer about the transformational potential of undergraduate degrees, that it's about the ways in which students' sense of who they are changes through their engagement with disciplinary knowledge. Okay, so they relate their personal projects to their disciplines in the world and they see themselves implicated. Okay, they're implicated by the knowledge with which they're engaging. Now the use of personal project there isn't really an arch archarian use, it's, it's, it comes from a different sense. But broadly it's a similar idea, that what students think they're trying to do in the world comes in relation to the knowledge they're studying and in some ways leads to a change in who they are and what they think the world is. And the crucial thing we found is this doesn't always happen. You know, unless students saw knowledge 
as important in what they were doing, there wasn't a change. So one of the papers we're working on at the moment takes students' dissertations and thinks about whether the way in which students write sociology in their dissertations is different from the way they talk about it in their second year. And again, what we found there was that if students just saw their dissertation as a way of writing about a very interesting issue, their sense didn't change. They needed to see sociology as a way of answering their question. So again, for us, that relationship to knowledge was absolutely crucial in trying to understand. And also, a relation to knowledge that's mediated and supported by teachers. You know, the crucial role that teaching plays in making that knowledge accessible to students. You know, and these aren't new ideas. You know, Murray was kind in the introduction saying, oh, you focus on knowledge. You know, that's been around for ages. These aren't particularly new things. And when I do these kind of talks, it's a bit embarrassing to say, well, higher education's about knowledge, you know. <laughs> really, Paul? Wow, you know. How long did that take you to work out? Um, <laughs> but there's something about it that's almost embarrassing to talk about. And, and, and there's something about that that, that I think is illuminative. It tells us something about the way we currently deal with higher education that, that we should take note of. So try and give you a sense of what this personally implicated in knowledge means. Here's a quote from a student we gave the pseudonym Esther, again, as I've said, from the project with um, Monica and Andrea. So she was saying, well, there's no destination with this discipline. It's like, you know, physics. Once you get to atoms and then you get to protons, there's always something further. And there's no point where you can stop and say, I understood I'm a sociologist. You can't understand everything. The thing is, sociology makes you aware of every decision you make, how that would impact on my life, how it could impact on someone else. And, that, and it makes the decision harder to make. So a sense of this personal wrestling with knowledge, and this not being easy, this not being straightforward, this being something that's challenging and changing. You know, and not all of the students we talked to are like Esther. You know, clearly I'm giving you a quote that fits with the point I'm making. But the point I'm trying to make is that this sense of transformation in relation to knowledge in which students are implicated um, tells us something about the transformational power of higher education. Now, of course, the reaction um, that I'm sure a number of you are having and that's quite common in this situation is, um, well, that's sociology, Paul. It's what you'd expect. That's, that's sociology. Um, so in a paper that we wrote, we looked at a number of other studies that took a similar approach. Um, so mathematics, accountancy, law, music, geography, and geoscience. And all these different studies looked at the ways in which students' engagement with their disciplines in higher education, you know, how, what, what the movement was through there. It's not a developmental hierarchy. It's not a sense these are stages students move through. But it's a sense of, well, if you look at what the most inclusive way of thinking about it and relate it to other ways of thinking using phenomenography, then this is what you come up with. So in mathematics, it moves from seeing maths as numbers to seeing maths as models to seeing mathematics as an approach to life. In accountancy, it moves from seeing accountancy as routine work to seeing it as me meaningful work to seeing it as moral work. In law, it moves from content to the system to an extension of yourself. In music, it moves from focusing on the instrument to focusing on the meaning of the music you're making to communicating to other people. In geography, there's a shift from the general world to a world structured into parts and then to interactions. And then in geoscience, there's a focus on the composition of the earth, proce processes focusing on interacting systems, and then relations between the earth and society. So I think they're not all the same. I think for me, there's two structures of variations, one that goes from the very particular to a system of meaning, to students' places in the system of meaning. And that's how I'd see sociology. Is it starts off, as one of our key informants says, as, as opinionology. Sociology is about having strong opinions on stuff and having arguments. To seeing it as about a system of meaning. You know, and that's what you'd expect any higher education to do. That's why it's higher education, is you're structuring things into a system that has parts that relate to each other and form a relational whole, to then a moment of reflexivity to relate back to Jenny's work about the student's place in the system. Others had a slightly different um, way of moving from the general to interacting systems to interacting systems that relate to the world. So in a way, a slightly non-human focus. And um, a project that Jenny 
um, case and Jan MacArthur, who's also here, and I are going to do as part of the Centre for Global Higher Education, is to do a project where we look at students in chemistry, like chemical engineering and chemistry and track them through their degrees longitudinally. And the reason we're looking in the UK and South Africa and the reason we're focusing on those disciplines is for exactly that reason of, oh, well, Paul, it's sociology. So let's take a non-human material subject and let's think about students' relations to knowledge within them. So, so far we've got to, okay, knowledge. Knowledge is really, really important. And now I have a quote from Faith, again from the project with Monica and Andrea. And she says, I'm a totally different person. I'm a lot more accommodating and tolerant than I was before. I would say a lot more independent, even dress sense. Everything has changed, everything. I would go to a lecture in a tra track suit before. Now I would not get caught dead in one. I think the older I grow, the more I realize that first impressions count. You never know who you're going to meet. You never know what network event might come up in the evening. You can't go looking like a tramp. You've just got to be a lot more aware of different aspects of yourself and be more confident. So the reason for um, reading that out is because that's not about knowledge. And, you know, that, that, there's no sense of knowledge there. And Faith, who was, you know, when you're in these projects, the students you, you interviewed yourself are always the ones that you have the richest sense of. And so Faith was one um, where I conducted a third year interview. And she was a black, black young woman from East London who'd come to this very prestigious university, which is why I've given it the pseudonym Prestige. And she was very, very close to dropping out. She really didn't like it. There was a real, you know, sort of almost um, archetypal split between her previous experience and coming to university. She was very much on the verge of um, dropping out. And then um, members of the Africa Caribbean Society at that university got hold of her and said, there is no way you're dropping out. You've got to this university. You've got a responsibility to make the most of it. And then she got massively into networking within our area and, and the golden triangle of um, looking at, at different firms in, in, in which to get jobs. So for her and her account, it wasn't about knowledge. So I don't want to make, you know, knowledge is crucial, but it's not everything within that sense. And so this is, trying to think about this is where I'm going to draw on the work with, um, that I did with Debbie McVitie, where we looked at the meanings of student engagement. So... The formation of understanding that I've got here, which is one way of thinking about student engagement, is the stuff I've been talking up, about up to now. Very much the idea that what you're doing is you're engaging with knowledge, you're engaging with your courses. But then you can have notions of student engagement that are about the formation of curricula. So a lot of work on student engagement is about involving students in doing work on their on curricular design. And part of what we argued in this paper, and I'm not sure whether it's right, but it's an argument we made, is that that notion of being involved in curriculum formation is predicated on the, un on, on, on the understanding that you're also a member of a course engaging in understanding. So there's an inclusive hierarchy here that, that the form being involved in the formation of curricula is dependent on the fact that you're engaged in the formation of um, understanding. And then the third move is there's a focus on the formation of communities. So what we would argue is that this is a way, or what we did argue in this paper, is that this is a way of bringing together different notions of student engagement by saying they have slightly different objects. So when you're focused on student engagement in terms of engaging in course, the object is understanding. When you're engaged in the formation of curricula, then that's the object of engagement. It's a different form of engagement. And then when you're involved in extracurricular activities, you're involved as a student union rep, then what you're engaged in, the object of your engagement, is the community. And so trying to say, well, actually, these things do come together. Five minutes. These things do come together. Ten minutes. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> higher, higher, higher. <laughs> um, um, <laughs> and uh, just winked at me. Um, and... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, well, that, that's half of it, gone. Anyway, so the idea is that, that, that you know, when, when you're doing those forms of student engagement, they're related because they build on each other, but they have different objects. And, and in the paper, we try and take this, this further by talking about different intensities of student engagement, different degrees of student engagement. So is it about consultation? Is it about partnership? Or is it about student leadership? And, and I won't go into detail now, but one of the things we're arguing in the paper is that more engagement in that sense isn't always necessarily better. 
So student leadership often comes about when students are completely fed up with the existing system. So at the University of Warwick, we're back there again, um, there was a big move from the post-economic society to target NSS scores because they were so annoyed with being taught this outdated, in their view, view of economics that contributed to the crash. And so to get the institution to listen to them, they said, OK, right, we're going to make sure the NSS scores are really low. So that's a form of massive student engagement, massive student leadership. But from an institutional's perspective, there might not be that many people. Uh, we, we have our PVC for education here. I'm sure, sure Sharon wouldn't be delighted if um, people took that, that position. So, 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 you know, as I've said, I'm not quite sure how this relates to, to, to what I've said previously. But, but for me, there's something about these forms of engagement and the way knowledge fits in that might start to give a sense about how you think about this in such a way as to not just get completely focused on knowledge, which, which is why I put it in there. So in trying to answer the question why would going to university um, change anyone, you know, where I'm at with this is, is that you have these relationships between the student self, knowledge, and the world. And so the fact that there's an arrow between self and the world shows that it's not just about knowledge. Um, and I think, you know, this, this sense of students developing relationships, that sense of how, the, how their disciplines or professional areas change the way they view themselves and change the way they view themselves, the world rather, is the key for me in trying to understand the transformational potential of um, higher education. And in lots of ways, it's very similar to the notions of reflexivity that um, Jenny was talking about in relation to Margaret Archer. I guess the one difference I would make and where, I, where I'd part company with critical realists is that, for me, this is just a simplification. It's just a way of giving a particular way of trying to understand transformational um, potential of higher education. It doesn't really encapsulate it. It simplifies it and renders it you know, something that we can talk about. Whereas Margaret Archer's chapter categories, because they tend to be critical realist, tend to position themselves as things really in the world. And I just, I, to me, that, 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 that's beyond what we can do. We can develop useful simplifications that are useful for doing particular things. But the idea we can talk about different forms of reality as critical realism does, to me, I, I, I think it goes beyond what we can do. We're, we're trapped in our humanness. We're trapped in the concepts we have to use to, to, um, to, you know, to understand the world. As, you know, Vygotsky writes beautifully about this, about how language gives us the, the ability to say things. Without language, we could say nothing, but it also gives us the pain that there are some things language can't say. You know, and we're always trapped in that tension between what language allows us to say but what, what, what language hides from us. The other thing for me that this highlights is the crucial importance of teaching. Um, and, and for me, you know, Lee Shulman's, again, sort of 1987, he, he was writing about this or it was published, you know, pedagogical content knowledge, the idea that the particular professionalism of teaching, teachers lies in bringing this particular aspect of knowledge and making it accessible to these particular groups of students. And that it's not about student-centered learning. It's not about knowledge-focused learning. It's about holding together your deep understanding of a body of knowledge and your deep understanding of who your students are and bringing them together. Now, that then brings us back to this tension. Because if it's about particular forms of knowledge and particular groups of students, how would comparison ever be possible? So the Yerevan communique that I talked about, you know, an element of it was emphasizing about making higher education systems transferable in the sense that a degree in one nation is the same as a degree in another nation. And if I'm making this argument about, well, actually, it's about these deeply personal relationships that shift with who the students are and what the disciplines are, that, for me, is where the tension lies. So just to give you two versions of comparability and to think about them, the first Bob's already um, touched on, which is league tables. So, you know, they're now a dominant way of um, thinking about and comparing quality. And as I mentioned, it was a key thing that we were looking at um, in the project with M Monica and Andrea. And, you know, you have to understand why they're popular. They're like money. You know, they're stable, they're durable, 
They move across contacts easily. You have, you know, I think we have to, as higher education, engage with that's why they're popular. Because they do work in an efficient way that people want done. Okay? But they also take unrelated incomparable measures, put them all together in a single metric, put rank things where the rankings have no statistical significance and no effect size. And equally, there's loads of already known solutions to these things. So you could easily ban institutions according to meaningful effect size. Everyone knows you could do this. No one does it. Because if you do that, its durability, its portability immediately is decreased. So, and the other thing that it does, and what we found clearly in, our, in the project with Monica and Andrea, was that it reinforces privilege. The higher status of an institution, the higher they'll be in a ranking. William Locke and John Richardson did a great study for Hefke, where they went round to the compilers of league tables. And compilers of league tables said, this is national UK league tables. Oh, no, we don't just look at the evidence. No, 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 no. We look at which are the good institutions. And if they're a bit low, we change our weighting. You know, as if this is completely unproblematic. And, uh, you know, and, and Peter Ashworth, the uh, Improving Student Le Learning con con um, Conference years ago, did this wonderful paper about counterfactual league tables and basically made a you know, stunning argument that people will only accept league tables that fit with their preconceived conceptions about which are the good institutions. And so unless Oxford, Cambridge, Imperial, and UCL are in the top Six of your league table, with Oxford and Cambridge in at least position one, two, or three, your league table is rubbish. And no one will pay any attention to it. And the fact that everyone knows this, this, this is not new, this is not Ashwin's insight for 2015, but everyone goes along with them. You know, um, you know, it's a great, I had a vice chancellor talk, you know, and said, oh, people ask me which league table is the best, and I tell them the one we're topping. <laughs> you know, that, that, you know, everyone knows their nonsense, but everyone engages with them. And crucially for the argument here, they tell us nothing about students' relationship to knowledge. How am I doing? One minute, okay. Could get there. Okay, so the second one, um, Bob also touched, uh, touched on, which is the assessment of higher education learning outcomes. Okay, so this is an OECD project where what they're trying to do is compare quality. So my critique of Lee Tables was a was that it tells us nothing about what students learn. But here we have something that looks at students' learning outcomes and tries to compare them. So in some ways, potentially um, more useful. You know, very unsurprisingly, the main work's focused on economics and engineering. Why unsurprisingly? Because they have international criteria, they have textbooks that are used across many different nations, and therefore some notion of a common curricula makes a lot more sense. But what would it look like in literature? It was really important. I was write, <laughs> writing this for someone, and they went, oh, you mean English literature? And I was like, oh, you don't get it, do you? The point is that it could be Spanish literature, it could be French literature, it could be, you know, how would you compare literature or history? You know, these don't make sense. So what they do in Hello is they say, oh, we'll have generic tests, you know, about these skills that graduates are supposed to desire. But for me, this is just nonsense because skillful performances, are they shaped by these generic skills? Am I always a bad communicator in the way that I'm being now? <laughs> or actually, is it more about my understanding of particular tasks, my interactions with people and things that changes? And if it is, then we're back to knowledge again. So this sense of being able to take learning outcomes and compare them is problematic even when you focus on learning outcomes. But then, as I highlighted at the beginning, this gives us attention as researchers. Because, yes, we can critique the distorting tendencies of these comparisons, but we also need to engage with their lit legitimacy. If we don't offer alternatives, then all we're doing is critiquing and critiquing. And I really worry about the propensity to critique in social science research. Because, say, in a UK context, you can easily end up implying, because of the damage done by schooling, to certain individuals. Because of the flaws in the health system, having universal education and universal healthcare are not an achievement. You know, and they're a massive democratic achievement. And so you've got to engage with thinking about, well, if this is problematic, what's an alternative to it, rather than always critiquing? So we need to face the danger that the individual durable and stable elements take precedence over the complex, changing, and country-specific. We need to recognize the fact that they distort, they simplify and they distort, 
you know, and in a way, what they do is, because they focus so much on comparison and they forget what higher education's about, they don't, they don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. They throw the baby out to keep the bathwater clean. You know, they forget what higher education is about just so they can compare. So we need to be aware of that, but we also need to think about ways in which we can make more meaningful comparisons. And I think that's where I'll finish, is that, you know, are there comparisons that we can make that are less distorting? You know, Murray talked before about enhancing quality. Murray's done some fascinating work on enhancement indicators rather than performance indicators. Does that offer a way? Or is there something about always making comparisons that's inevitably difficult? I think my view on this is that any measure has a short lifespan. There's Goodhart's law that any, any measure when it becomes a, no, what is it? Any, it went, yeah, any measure when it becomes a target ceases to be a good measure. And so any way of measuring is, that gets in, in, ingrained in policy is going to have a short um, shelf life. But there are things we can do. I've already mentioned about bans. You also, in something like the National Student Survey, you could change, you could change the items every year. You could easily say, say to institutions, look, here's a bank of, of 1,000 items. There'll be 30 a year. They'll cover these areas. You don't know what they are. So you could stop game playing. You could do more intelligent things with them. And I think that's a challenge that I have in our relations with policy as higher education researchers, is trying to come up with things that accept the legitimacy legitimacy of measures about higher education when governments and particularly students are paying huge amounts of money for it but doing so in a way that tries to do less harm and actually takes us to a more critical understanding of higher education. Well done Paul. You're on fire, mate. Um, <laughs> no, that was I great. I am, literally. That, that was great. Yeah, your pants. <laughs> the smoke coming out I of I thought you hadn't noticed. Uh, I thought it was uh, uh, appropriate to, to let Paul finish properly there. Um, we, we've got about uh, uh, six or seven minutes for any questions. Yeah. I'm um, sort of going back to your... Um, some of this morning's discussion in your paper yeah, yeah, yeah. in 2015 about yeah. how to cohere higher education policy researchers around big aims yeah. of, or uniting aims such as the one you've mentioned. And it's just how any thoughts? I mean, that's a nice one. The NSS was a nice example. Yeah. Of that example. But, you know, the existing societies we have and the journals, is it, are there ways that you see potential for. I, I, I think there are. I, I think it's about. It's about focusing on alternatives rather than critique, you know, so, you know, because if all you offer is critique, then policymakers just disengage because that's all they ever hear, you know. Um, Monica and I did a policy event from the project that Murray also spoke at where um, the, 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 you know, high up person in biz came along to tell us how wonderful David Willits was and if we sat in a room with him, we'd realise how much he cared. Um, and her response to what we were saying from our project was, huh, all you researchers ever say is that it's complex. So, so we've got to accept the need for simplifications. The other thing I think we've got to do is we've got to act more collectively. You know, there, there's such a push in the way that we deal with impact, in the way that we deal pa with papers, for people to want to make their name, for want to, it to be their idea that, that was the one that showed us how this is all nonsense. And actually, I think just working more collectively about ways of developing things like enhancement indicators and being honest about when they work and when they don't work. Because the thing of focusing on individuals is you get so invested in the thing, you know, so say my PhD was on peer learning, and you start off, oh, well, of course, peer learning is brilliant, does all these things. Of course it doesn't. You know, it's as flawed as anything else. And so there's something, I think, in trying to work collectively and build things together that accepts the, accepts the legitimacy of the demands made for making comparisons, but also tries to minimise the distortions. And, and, and recognising that, in the end, there won't be an, an answer. You know, that in the end, we'll all be dead and we'll all be wrong. But what you can do is you can try and, and build things that offer a different way of doing things. And I think if you can't build alternatives, then you need to get out of the way and let someone else try because, because critique is an incredibly important starting point. You can't go anywhere without critique. But if that's your ending point, then you're a leisured academic who's not actually engaging with, with, with things that are, you know, 
they're at stake. I can feel an abusive chair coming on. <laughs> uh, I'll let, I'll let an, an old white man say something first. I know you well, I did have an answer. Yes, there's nobody with their high hands up at the moment. That's all right then, yeah. Uh, I was just interested in that last comment about, about uh, measures and, and targets and so on. I mean, that will never happen to the NSS, will it? The, thousand bank, the bank of a thousand questions. Because it's not just a comparative instrument, it's a policy instrument. It's actually to bring about change. And it's carefully designed to bring, and very effective actually at bringing about. But, but there's nothing special about those items. You know, they, they, they I mean, they, you know, I mean, this is, this goes back to Bob's point um, about, so, so when I was um, at the conference with Manja Klementschitz in Europe, there were people there who said, well, you know, prov providing we get the um, analytics right of any questionnaire, then all of your, you know, exactly the same thing, all of your problems will be answered. And people invest the NSS items with, you know, they're not that well designed, they're not that clever either. There's nothing special. Yeah, yeah, I know you're not saying they are, but actually, yes, for, from a policymaker's perspective, there's a sense of that change can't happen, but actually, there's nothing partic particularly special about them. There's, there's, you know, there's loads and loads of different types of questionnaires that tap into the same angles of student learning, and you could easily change the items, to, you know, because, because what you have at the moment is people gaming the items. So the classic example is feedback. So feedback on the NSS scores has a lower average than any other scales. But statistically, this means nothing. It might just be a lower scoring scale. These things happen all the time. It means nothing. But what have universities done is they sit in meetings going, oh, students don't realize what feedback is. So what we're going to do is when we talk to them, we're going to tell them, you're having a feedback moment. You know, <laughs> as if that's going to change the quality of their learning. It, you know, it's, there's something about that that, that logic that is just nonsense. And, and it might never change, but, but our responsibility is to try and change it. You know, we, you know success isn't in our hands, but, but to collectively, you know, and the thing is that if you act collectively and do that, your chances of, the quality of what you do will be much higher, and your chances of success will be much higher. Is part of the problem with that, the fact that they're always conflating, and a lot of these measures are conflating satisfaction with learning? Um, they're two different things. Student satisfaction doesn't actually reflect what's being learned, and in the same way, that all these measures don't actually reflect. Yeah, it sort of is, but but I, I've. You know, in the studies I've done, there's plenty of other, other studies that do this. If you look at student scores on approaches to learning, which you know are a rough and ready reasonable measure of learning, they're not brilliant, but they're okay, and you correlate it to satisfaction, they all, always, nearly always, correlate quite highly. So, so for me, the big critique of the student survey that it's just a satisfaction survey and it's a meaningless grunt of students being satisfied, I, I don't buy. Because in, you know, in our interviews with students that Monica and I and Andrea did, we had students saying, I want teachers who challenge me. I want teachers who, when my mobile phone goes off, say, you don't do that in my class, that's not appropriate. You know, so, so, so I think uh, you know, you know, there, there's a sort of golden ageism sometimes in these critiques, that the past was wonderful and we're a tiny tiptoe away from hell. And, you know, and actually, to me, that, that is, that is um, a reactionary position that's disguised as somehow being radical. And there's nothing radical about it. So I think we take students seriously, we engage them in partnerships and thoughts about what higher education is about, and we accept that they have one perspective that's as legitimate as ours, but is a different perspective. That's fine. If, if we don't have things we can offer students within higher education, then why would they come? So I think we have to own our own expertise, but we also have to own the legitimacy of what students make of the, their experiences. So, so for me, I've always found the satisfaction critique a bit, bit of a dead end because, because, because it just assumes that students are, are incredibly passive. And, and, that, and that's not been my experience. You know, because I, I say that because if they're satisfied but it, they're satisfied because it's all very jolly, then that suggests that, that that's what, they're there to be entertained rather than there to ask difficult questions about themselves, their disciplines and the world. Paul, can I just stop you? I think we've just got one more question. Do you want to sneak in? It's, a, it's kind of ill-formed, but I'm just wondering if part of the issue is around the possibility for honest reflection on mistakes in a public sphere. And my experience of earlier in Scotland was that it, it can achieve that, um, at least within 
Well, at least within closed rooms, you know. Um, but I'm not sure where else. We do it a little bit with the external examining system. Um, and I guess whenever we're talking about, whenever we're competing, it's just bullshit, isn't it? Basically, it, it becomes this kind of terrible language which is, which is divorced from reality. But somehow, I said it was an ill-formed yeah, uh, yeah. question, but I'm just interested in your thoughts on how else we allow that kind of honest reflection on mistakes and weakness I, in a public sphere. I, I think by being honest ourselves, you know, and, and I think universities have, a, you know, all the things done to universities, universities have participated in wholeheartedly. Mm. The RA and the REF couldn't have existed if, if academics weren't happy to engage in those panels, do those things. QIA inspectors. By the way, I'm not saying that they're dreadful things. I'm just pointing out that they couldn't have happened without the active involvement of academics. So I think we have to be honest ourselves about, about how things failure. For, you know, how, how things go wrong. And we also, you know, getting away from good practice, getting away from teaching excellence. All of us, when we teach, we have moments when things just go so badly. The thing just falls flat on its face and you walk out there and you think, oh my God, oh my God. You know, it happens to everyone. You know, and, and everyone, I'm sure, has moments where it really works for them. And a lot of teaching for me, as I, I taught, was about developing a teaching persona that allowed me to to not be me completely out there, but to accept when things went right and they went wrong. But all the time we're talking about teaching excellence and good practice, we're pretending that you are the, either are a good teacher or you're not a good teacher, and it's nonsense. You know, it's about a relationship, your relationship to knowledge, your relationship to your students, and how you set up that relationship between students and knowledge. And sometimes that will go brilliantly, other times it won't, and, and actually, you know, that more, you know, and also accepting that teaching is an incredibly blunt tool. You know, it can, it can get ideas out there, but only in a sort of blunt way, and then students have to do the work. And so I think if we, you know, if, if we try to not trip out teaching excellence, this, this, that, and the other, and we're more honest, then at least, at least that becomes an acceptable thing to say. And my experience of when you do those things is it's incredibly powerful, because everyone thinks, oh, okay. It's no longer a competition about, you know, how big your feet are. Um, <laughs> I'm glad you yeah, held yeah, yourself yeah, back yeah, there, yeah, Paul. Yeah. It took me a while. Uh, Paul, can I just... Yeah, stop? Yeah, 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 only because we're, we're going to... Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, I think Paul has thrown down a really interesting challenge for us because there's, a, there's, there's this problem of a kind of a, an inherent... Uh, mutual exclusivity between the notion of, of comparisons uh, and standards across a sector and the, the kind of uh, uh, much more sort of sens sensitive, situated uh, kind of authenticity that, that you, you've been talking about. And that really is, uh, you know, as well, the question is, is whether there is that mutual exclusivity or whether there is a way of picking our way through it. Anyway, I'm sure we'd like to show our appreciation for Paul's talk again. <laughs>